Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is April 1, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 63. For two days now news here in the United States has been dominated by the Presidential Assassination Attempt Monday afternoon. The entity Ronald Reagan emerged from the Hilton Hotel waving and smiling at the press and bystanders. Then half a dozen or more shots rang out in rapid fire. The President, reportedly hit once, was thrown into his limousine which sped off. Also hit were a Secret Service agent, a Washington policeman, and White House Press Secretary James Brady with a bullet through the brain. It all happened at 2.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 30, 1981. By the time people were coming home from work and tuning in to the continuing news coverage, it was already beginning to look cut and dried. A lone assassin, we were quickly assured. An oddball of some kind. Certainly no hint of a conspiracy. But, my friends, it is always the early reports that contain the truth. In the early moments after an episode like this, the unseen censorship of our controlled news media does not function so effectively. It is only after the story is told and retold that the untidy gems of truth are weeded out. In those early moments there were a number of puzzles which went unexplained and unmentioned later on. The most significant of these was a report on NBC television by NBC reporter Judy Woodruff. She was a close eye witness and said, quote, I was probably one car length and a half away from the President's limousine when the shots were fired. People immediately hit the ground, and I noticed there were some shots fired from an overhanging from a sidewalk that was above where the President's car was." Unquote. Then she continued with other comments. My friends, those words of NBC's Judy Woodruff can only mean that there were at least two gunmen. By now every American must have seen the televised assassination attempt for himself over and over again, and the arrested suspect was not the one described by Judy Woodruff. He was not the one firing from an overhanging structure or sidewalk above the President's car. Instead. He was on a street level, close to the TV cameras and reporters. Just eight seconds after she spoke the words I just quoted, Judy Woodruff was cut off in the middle of her report, and since that moment there has been no more talk about the assassin firing from above the President. That is, not by the reporters. There have been related comments by several different medical spokesmen interviewed on television. They spoke of a downward shot which just grazed the President's chest but was deflected into his body when it struck a rib, and last night NBC Nightly News even showed a diagram to this effect, but no one is daring to ask the logical question, how could a bullet fired by the suspect we saw have struck the President from above? You saw it all for yourself, my friends. The President was not bending over when he was hit, but standing straight. The only thing that does explain the bullet from above is what Judy Woodruff reported just once on NBC television. I'm sorry to say that the warnings which I made public in AUDIO LETTERS 60 and 61 are starting to be fulfilled already. The Bolsheviks here apparently failed this time to cut short the new administration. But this is only a reprieve, my friends. They are obsessed with the determination to retake total control of the United States Government. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviks here are continuing to flex their muscles in other ways. In particular, they are hard at work to condition our minds to become more belligerent toward Russia, even though we will be committing mass suicide. The next major step in this plan is a four-part mini-series to begin Sunday, April 5 on ABC television. The series, titled Masada, was filmed in Israel at a cost of $20 million. 
It's the story of more than 900 Jews who rebelled against ancient Rome and held out for years against impossible odds. Then faced with the inevitable Roman victory, the Jews of Masada supposedly committed mass suicide rather than be captured. Ancient Masada, my friends, was the model for the Guyana kibbutz of Jim Jones. At Jonestown, just as at Masada, more than 900 men, women, and children were supposed to have committed mass suicide rather than surrender to the imagined enemies of Jim Jones. But it was actually mass murder, not mass suicide. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 40, Guyana is intended by the Bolsheviks to be the model for the United States. They want us to develop a Masada complex because they want us to commit mass suicide in a war we know we cannot win, all to benefit the Bolsheviks alone. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, First Strike Planning by America and Russia. Topic No. 2, The Economic Road to Dictatorship in America. And Topic No. 3, Your Decision to Flee or to Fight. Topic No. 1, As I say these words, a great tragedy is unfolding slowly in Poland. Less than a year ago a new workers' union called Solidarity started gaining power in Poland. It appeared to hold out the promise of a better life for Poles. Instead, the Solidarity Union has consistently moved Poland to the brink of crisis after crisis. Each crisis has been more dangerous than the one before it. Now Poland is moving closer to confrontation with Russia, which it cannot possibly win. What Solidarity is doing in Poland is to taunt the Russian bear. The moment one crisis is averted, another is set in motion in a relentless campaign of labor turmoil. By its actions, Solidarity is telling Russia, If you do not intervene militarily, we will take Poland away from you. After Poland, we will break off Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and even East Germany, and then turn them all into enemies on your doorstep. In AUDIO LETTER No. 59 last October, I gave a warning that this was the true purpose of the Solidarity Union in Poland. Solidarity did not spring up spontaneously from the working masses of Poland itself. Instead, it is financed and controlled by the Bolsheviks here in the United States and abroad. The secret purpose of Solidarity is not to serve Poland's workers, but to use them. Poland is being forged into another Guyana to be sacrificed on the altar of Satanic Bolshevik power. Already Poland's economy is faltering due to the recurring strikes and turmoil. Food shortages, a favorite Bolshevik weapon, are growing steadily worse, and now the prospect of military intervention is looming ever closer. Twenty-five years ago Hungary erupted in revolution and Polish workers rioted. Russia wasted no time in putting down those outbursts by force, yet the United States Government did nothing at all except to wring its hands for public consumption, because in those days the secret Rockefeller Soviet Alliance was in full swing. The contrast between then and now could hardly be more dramatic, my friends. It is hard to say which nation's behavior has changed more, that of Russia or of America. By comparison to a quarter century ago, Russia has moved towards patience and tolerance. First, in full compliance with the Helsinki Accord, Polish workers were allowed to form their own union independent of government control. In the old Bolshevik days that would have been unheard of in itself. Then nearly a year of turmoil and crisis has been allowed to pass without military action by Russia. Instead, there have been government concessions and even a change of government in Poland, all to defuse labor crises. From any objective viewpoint, 
All of this adds up to far more tolerant behavior by Russia than 25 years ago. And yet what is America's response compared to 1956? The answer is that the United States is now reacting to a lesser provocation with greater belligerence. In recent days the United States has issued public warnings to Russia which are so blunt as to make Russia lose face if she does not act. Like the Polish Solidarity Union itself, the United States is goading and taunting the Russian bear. So Russia has moved toward moderation while America has moved toward belligerence. The public itself is now beginning to see for itself the collapse of the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance, which began coming apart in 1976, five years ago. The split began with a still-secret underwater missile crisis in the summer of that year. The four Rockefeller brothers tried desperately to patch things up, but Russia finished severing the alliance in September 1977. Russia began the massive deployment of a whole new generation of manned space weapons, her unique space triad, and in the process America's secret military control of space was broken. All of this was tied directly to drastic changes taking place within the ruling circles of Russia. I have detailed all of this in the course of many past AUDIO LETTER REPORTS. Today it is no longer Russia but the United States which is dying from the cancer of Bolshevism. The old Bolsheviks who used to control Russia have been overthrown and expelled from Russia by the hundreds of thousands, and now they are replacing the Rockefeller Cartel as the most powerful faction in America. Meanwhile, having overthrown the Satanic Bolsheviks, Russia's secret new Christian rulers are struggling to revive the spiritual roots of Russia. Step by step they are reopening churches, welcoming legal shipments of Bibles into Russia, and allowing religious broadcasts into Russia without jamming so long as they are non-political. But eradicating the deep scars of 60 years of Bolshevism is a long and complex task. It requires a complete overhaul of the economic and cultural life of a vast nation. The overthrown Bolsheviks have no intention of letting the secret new Kremlin rulers finish the job. Instead, they are obsessed with a frenzy to bring Russia to her knees once again. In order to do that, the Bolsheviks are using their new active power base here in the United States. Step by step they are maneuvering America toward an all-out war against Russia. In the summer of 1978 I reported that America was secretly shifting to a first-strike nuclear strategy. That is the only way by which the lopsided military superiority of Russia can be offset to some degree. At that time Russia too was making preparations to be able to mount a first strike if need be. But for about two years now the Russian first strike planning has been on a back burner. Instead the Russian Kremlin shifted its emphasis to intervention directly within the United States Government. Russia's decision to do this followed the assassination of Nelson Rockefeller in late January 1979. The Bolsheviks here were launching an all-out coup d'etat at the highest levels of power in America. They were moving fast with plans for a Middle East war to erupt that same spring. That in turn was to lead to Nuclear War I. To prevent that, the Kremlin engaged the Bolsheviks in a no-holds-barred intelligence war, a war of doubles here in Washington. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46 I revealed Russia's secret weapon in the War of Doubles, her robotoids. These entities look and act human, but they are not human. They are simply man-made products of highly advanced genetic engineering. When I made public what I did about the robotoids, I was met by widespread disbelief. Genetic engineering was not in the news then and did not start making headlines until at least a year later, 
and so many of my listeners simply closed their minds, declared that such a thing was impossible, and turned away. But lately I am being asked more and more about this very subject, these genetic replicas of human beings. With all the publicity in recent months about genetic engineering, it is hardly any wonder. What sounded impossible and taboo less than two years ago is now being hinted at in the daily news. For example, the New York Times carried a big article just one week ago on March 24 about so-called gene machines, quote unquote. In the light of what I first reported in May 1979, some words from the article are worth quoting, because all this has a direct bearing on an historical turning point which has just taken place. The Times article begins with the words, quote, Someday there will probably be a library containing all the genetic information needed to create a complete human being. This idea, alarming to some, enticing to others, is no longer entirely a flight of science fantasy. New techniques and automated machines are enormously increasing scientists' ability to spell out the message of heredity in living cells, to put together their own artificial messages in the universal genetic code, and to analyze in complete detail the proteins on which all life depends. New instruments promise to compress into days or hours painstaking research that used to occupy weeks, months, or years." Unquote. My friends, there was nothing at all like this in the news two years ago. These words were published only last week in the New York Times, but if you will compare those words with what I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 46, I believe it will speak for itself. And always keep in mind what you already know yourself. Whatever is made public is always many years behind the latest secret developments. In AUDIO LETTER No. 51 I revealed that the Bolsheviks also had begun deploying genetic replicas called synthetics. A new kind of guerrilla war began at that point, unsuspected by the public, pitting Russian robotoids against Bolshevik synthetics. To the many who are asking about the latest in this unseen tug of war, my comments are unchanged from AUDIO LETTER No. 55. The situation continues to change daily both here and in Russia, so I can only urge you to keep this in mind as you see events unfold. You will continue to see instances of strange behavior by high public officials along with flip-flops and U-turns in policy both domestic and foreign. These are the inevitable by-products of the continuing secret war of genetic doubles. Another result of this secret war is even more serious. It has to do with a historical turning point which we have just passed. A few minutes ago I mentioned that the Kremlin's contingency planning for a nuclear first strike were put on the shelf about two years ago, but now I must report to you that those plans are no longer on the shelf. They are being revived and updated for use in the highest priority. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 last June I reported that the Bolsheviks were making an all-out attack to retake control of the Kremlin. They were using every weapon at their disposal, including synthetics. For a while the Bolsheviks were on the verge of success. Russia's new ruling group were wounded badly, and many were killed. It all took place without any notice to the public. But without explanation Russia's expulsion of Bolsheviks slowed to a trickle in mid-1980, and that is how it remained throughout the second half of 1980. As of now, Russia's new rulers appear to have beaten back the Bolshevik onslaught on the Kremlin. Two months ago in mid-January Russia abruptly resumed the wholesale expulsion of Bolsheviks, but the battle still is not over. There is still turmoil in the Kremlin, and earlier this month the Bolshevik tide out of Russia was cut back once again. 
Russia's new rulers have just had a very close call. In the meantime, new war preparations have been rushing ahead here in the United States. A whole new grand strategy to bring on nuclear war is now being set in motion. Many details of this vast new plan still remain to be worked out, and also the Bolsheviks are having to work around the limited power now exercised by the crumbling Rockefeller cartel. Even so, the broad outlines of the new war strategy are already clearly defined. The new Bolshevik road to Nuclear War I consists of five parallel tracks. They are moving down all five tracks at once, advancing on five fronts. These five tracks are Track 1, keep the Russians off balance by means of internal turmoil. Track 2, get the American people ready for war. Track 3, a limited but crucial American military return to space. Track 4. Continued expansion of offensive weaponry for a nuclear war. And Track 5. The creation of unprecedented multiple crises in the world. I have already told you a little about Track 1 of the plan, that is, fomenting internal problems in Russia. As for Track 2, I mentioned a little about the psychological programming of America for war in my introduction. Our preparation for war economically and politically deserves further comment, and I will do just that in my second topic. Track 3 of the Bolshevik War Path revolves around the Space Shuttle program. In AUDIO LETTER No. 62 I revealed the secret military mission of the Shuttle Columbia scheduled for launch early this month. Its purpose is to place a laser-armed, hardened spy satellite in orbit. If it succeeds, it will be the first time in three years that the United States has had a spy satellite on duty for any length of time. Russia has destroyed all the others. I also revealed in my last report that the Space Shuttle Spectacular scheduled to begin shortly will actually involve two shuttles, not just one. I can now report that the plan is to carry out four military missions like this. This can be done even if a shuttle is lost on every mission, because, my friends, there are five Space Shuttles already in existence. Only two of these have ever been seen in public, the Enterprise in 1977 and the Columbia now at Cape Canaveral. The other three are being kept out of sight. Under Track 4 of the War Plan, offensive weapons of all kinds are being readied, some secret, some not. At one extreme are the secret weapons. One of these is the secretly deployed American mobile ICBM, the Minuteman TX, which I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 55. Another is the fleet of 52 remaining Titan II missiles armed with giant Cobalt Doomsday warheads, as I reported last September. At the opposite extreme are the publicly known strategic weapons. They too are being readied, no matter how obsolete they have become. For example, last month on February 8, the Strategic Air Command carried out its largest air operation since World War II. Sacked through everything it had into the exercise. Hundreds of weary old B-52s groaned into the air, along with assorted FB-111s and tankers. When war comes, the Bolsheviks know that very few will get through to their targets, and none will return. But they will be thrown into the conflict anyway, just for nuisance value. The Bolshevik attitude is, every little bit helps. All these things are important, my friends, but Track 5 of the plan may be the most important of all. That is the part of the plan calling for multiple crises. It is through these crises that the Bolsheviks expect to achieve what they have been denied up to now, a foolproof trigger for a Nuclear War One. They plan to confront the Russians with so many potential avenues to war that the Russians cannot cover them all. Because of this plan, the whole world will soon be seething with strife and turmoil. 
we will no longer see merely one crisis after another. Instead it will be two, three, four, five major crises in the world all at the same time. Even now it is beginning to happen. Right now there are simultaneous crises in El Salvador and in Poland. One threatens Russia's client state Cuba while the other threatens Russia itself. And in the months to come there will be more involving the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, Red China, and Australia. All five tracks in the emerging Bolshevik war path converge about mid-1982. By then they expect to have America on a war footing, as I will explain further in my second topic. All four Space Shuttle missions are planned to be completed by then. The offensive weapons now in the works will be ready, and by then the world will be in a cauldron of crises made to order for setting off nuclear war suddenly and without warning. Just as crises in the Balkans triggered World War I, a world in crisis will trigger NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Russian intelligence has already informed the Kremlin about the new grand plan of the Bolsheviks here. Russia's rulers have considered that information in the light of their own deadly struggle to retain control of Russia's government during the past year, and they have come to a decision. The time has come for Russia to resume preparations for their own first strike against the United States. In January 1980 I revealed that the hardliners were once again in control in the Kremlin. They believe nuclear war is inevitable, that the Bolsheviks will keep trying until they bring it about. In their view, the only realistic approach is to prepare to win the inevitable conflict with minimum casualties to Russia. In addition, their planning is aimed at minimizing casualties and irreversible environmental damage to planet Earth. In AUDIO LETTER No. 38 I described what the Russian rulers call their cosmic perspective. They are looking ahead to the day when planet Earth itself will be the headquarters of the interplanetary Russian Empire. If the Bolsheviks here succeed in striking first, the Earth will be poisoned with deadly radiation and radioactive fallout worldwide. Yet the Bolsheviks themselves will largely escape the fate which they will bring down upon the rest of us, because by picking the moment for war they will be able to hide safe and sound in expensive government war bunkers. But Russia's rulers have no intention of letting that happen. They now intend to strike first. They plan to destroy American missiles in their silos and thereby prevent their old-style nuclear warheads from contaminating the Earth. Instead, the Russians intend to fight the entire war with their New Age weapons which produce no fallout. There will be geophysical warfare, shattered reservoirs and dams, neutron bombs, and particle beam blasts from Cosmospheres overhead and from the Moon. In short order, the United States as we know it will be no more, but our agony will be for us alone. There will be no fallout to plague the rest of the world. Within the United States, rural areas and small towns without military or other Federal installations will be spared. If the Russians follow through on this plan, Rural areas will be relatively safe in the initial attack. Even so, the fate that now awaits our nation beggars description. We have allowed the Satanic Bolsheviks to live among us, to warp our ideals, and to corrupt our nation. We have not resisted their intrigues to get us into war. So now plans are being made by Russia to exterminate the Bolsheviks here. And when that happens, my friends, tens of millions of us will also die with them. Topic No. 2 Last week on March 26 a new Presidential Council was created by a Presidential Executive Order. It's called the President's Council on Integrity and Efficiency. 
The Council will have 23 members. This will include officials from the Office of Management and Budget, the FBI, the Justice Department, the General Accounting Office of Congress, and representatives of certain Cabinet Secretaries. It will also include 16 Inspectors General assigned to various Government departments. The post of Inspector General is itself a new one. It was created by Congress in 1978. It was the Treasury Inspector General who sent a useless report concerning Fort Knox to Senator William Proxmire last September 30, 1980. I have discussed that report for you in previous AUDIO LETTERS recently. It gave the superficial impression of an investigation to protect the public interest, but its only real function was to help keep the lid on the covered-up gold scandal. Likewise, we are told that the new Council on Integrity and Efficiency is being created to root out waste, fraud, and inefficiency in government. We're supposed to believe that it will be the government's way of keeping watch on itself, but, my friends, this is nothing more than sugarcoating for dictatorship. It is taken straight from the pages of the secret new Constitution for America which I first made public in 1975. We are witnessing the creation of what the secret new Constitution calls the Watchkeeping Service." Quote unquote. The so-called Watchkeeping Service would be headed by an official designated the Watchkeeper. The Watchkeeper, my friends, corresponds to the Chairman of the new Council on Integrity and Efficiency, Edwin Harper. The secret new Constitution specifies, quote, With the assistance of an appropriate staff, the Watchkeeper shall gather and organize information concerning the adequacy, competence, and integrity of governmental agencies and their personnel." Unquote. Further on, the new Constitution adds that to carry out the purposes of the Watchkeeping Service, quote, personnel may be appointed, investigations made, witnesses examined, post audits made, and information required." Unquote. If you are one of those who demanded a copy of the Treasury Inspector General's report to Senator Proxmire, the words I just read from the secret new Constitution should sound very relevant. These things are exactly what the so-called Inspector Generals pretend to do, and in describing the new Council on Integrity and Efficiency, White House spokesman said that the Council will have the job of developing, quote, a core of well-trained and highly skilled auditors and investigators." Unquote. My friends, I first made public the secret new Constitution for America in my AUDIO BOOK Talking Tape No. 4 in July 1975. Shortly after that I also released a pamphlet containing the entire text of the secret new Constitution. That is what I was reading from a few moments ago. As I detailed in my special AUDIO BOOK TAPE, it is an elaborate prescription for corporate socialist dictatorship here in America. When I first made the secret new Constitution public in 1975, the late Nelson Rockefeller, then as Vice President, was hoping to bring it into being all at once. At the same time, he expected to make himself President of the new disguised dictatorship for nine years, and if Sarah Jane Moore had not missed when she shot at then-President Gerald Ford, Rockefeller might have succeeded. But by the grace of God it did not turn out that way. So instead Nelson's late brother John D. Rockefeller III spearheaded an alternate plan. In full-page ads all across America, a Manifesto of Change was published. It proclaimed a so-called Bicentennial Era from 1976 to 1989. It was said that it took 13 years from the beginning of the American Revolution to the final emergence of America's new government 200 years ago. 
and so they said they would give themselves that long again, if need be, to once again revolutionize America's government. Most people have long since forgotten all about the Bicentennial and its obscure decorations of change to come, but step by step, gradually, the secret Constitution is already being implemented all around us. It was set in motion by the corporate socialist Rockefeller cartel, and ever since the November 1980 election the crumbling Rockefeller machine has been trying to push it ahead. Even the loud cries of governmental deregulation are not what they appear to be. They are actually intended to pave the way for the so-called corporate authorities spelled out in the secret new Constitution. These would enable big business to function free of government restraint and yet exercise life and death power over all small businessmen. It was all set in motion by the four Rockefeller brothers in their heyday, but two years ago the brothers were secretly removed by the Bolsheviks, and now the Bolsheviks themselves are turning part of these corporate socialist plans against the Rockefeller cartel. An example was the Supreme Court Bronte decision which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 61. Because of that decision the new Administration here in Washington has already started reappointing some of the Inspectors General who were Carter holdovers, so it is a very mixed bag right now. The regrouped Rockefeller forces under John J. McCloy are slowly gaining power, but as I reported in AUDIO LETTERS No. 60 and 61 for November and January, the Bolsheviks intend to cut short the so-called Reagan Administration. Two days ago, outside the Washington Hilton Hotel here, it almost happened already. As it turned out, the Reagan Administration was not halted that time, but there will be some slowdown in the plans of the Rockefeller cartel. Meanwhile the Bolsheviks here will redouble their efforts to retake total control of the United States Government. Meanwhile the United States is being shut down to get ready for war. Money is being diverted from all kinds of programs with the excuse that they are wasteful and inflationary, but the funds are being dumped instead into the most wasteful and inflationary use of all, massive funding for unproductive weapons to fight a needless and hopeless war. In spite of all the political rhetoric about fighting inflation, it will grow steadily worse. One cosmetic measure after another will be announced, but they will not work, my friends, because they are not supposed to work. Finally the time will be ripe for dramatic action. The President will announce to the nation that the situation is desperate. He will say that the time has come for tough action, and millions of Americans will agree and with that he will declare a national economic emergency. It will be like August 1971 all over again. President Nixon declared an economic emergency supposedly to fight inflation. There were dramatic actions for cosmetic effect, including wage and price controls, but the most important action was hardly noticed. Nixon closed the gold window for international settlements. It was actually a secret declaration of war against the dollar, disguised to look like the opposite. It set off the stagflation era with inflation far worse than what had gone before. Once again we will be told that a national economic emergency is being declared in order to fight inflation, and just as before there will be dramatic measures for psychological impact. But in the end the result will again be just to make matters worse. As of now the plans are being laid to declare the National Economic Emergency toward the end of this year, 1981. The most dramatic part of the plan has to do with the $100 bill. In that connection our psychological programming for things to come is already beginning by way of the so-called news. Right now we are hearing more and more about the old theory that the money supply is the key to inflation, 
Those who subscribe to this money supply theory are called monetarists. Monetarist theory no longer holds water, as I explained eight years ago in my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. In this age of multinational corporations, other forces are far more important than the money supply, but the new Administration is packed with monetarists. They are hinting that if only we could restrain the money supply, inflation would dampen down. In a seemingly unrelated vein, lately we are hearing a great deal about the tons of cash being used by organized crime. A recent story on the CBS television program 60 Minutes was an example of this. The story dealt with the oceans of $100 bills flowing through Miami banks these days. There are so many that they are not counted, they are weighed. The program showed $100 bills being bundled and stacked for storage and shipment to other banks by the Federal Reserve Branch Bank in Miami. The point of the program was that much of this money was drug money. Banks are taking in enormous amounts of cash, mostly in $100 bills, in areas where organized crime is heavy. Yet in other areas, cash is scarce. If you don't believe that, just go to your bank and try to withdraw $1 or $2,000 in cash if you have that much in an account. In many areas you will be refused. The bank will tell you that you will have to wait until the cash will become available. In this and other ways, my friends, the $100 bill will gradually be turned into a straw man to be knocked down in a coming economic emergency. When the economic emergency is declared, the Presidential Executive Order will declare the $100 bill illegal tender. Everyone holding $100 bills will be given a short time to redeem them. The redemption period currently planned will be three days. After that, the $100 bill will be repudiated by the United States. If you are still holding any after that, you will simply be out of luck. To redeem your $100 bills, you will be required to go to your own bank, one where you have an account. No bank will be required to redeem bills for non-depositors unless you will sign an affidavit that you have no accounts in any other bank. When you turn in your $100 bills at the bank, you will be required by Presidential Executive Order to give your name, address, and Social Security number. If you turn in more than a certain small amount, perhaps $500, you will also be required to sign an affidavit stating where you got them. Up to that same small amount, the bank will redeem your $100 bills in cash of smaller denominations. Any amount beyond that will be redeemed only as a deposit to your account at any one time. All of this will come as a complete shock to the American people. The only advance notice of the $100 bill repudiation will go to foreign central banks. A mere 24 hours before the emergency declaration they will be informed about it. The vast quantities of $100 bills abroad will be subject to the same brief redemption period as here in the United States. America's repudiation of the $100 bill will be portrayed as a tough attack on inflation and on crime as well. The disclosure provisions will be said to be designed to reveal holders of concealed wealth including criminals. More importantly, the elimination of the $100 bill will supposedly help bring the money supply under control and with it inflation. $100 bills now constitute about one-third of the total dollar value of all United States currency in circulation here and abroad. Under the plan, many will be redeemed as bank deposits, that is, bookkeeping entries. Those can be watched and controlled far more easily than cash. We will even be told that the supposed anti-crime angle will have an anti-inflation bonus. Criminals holding large hordes of $100 bills may decide never to turn them in and thereby reveal themselves, and that will result in an actual drop in the money supply. 
The monetarists will assure us that this will be like poking a pin into the swollen balloon of inflation. The Presidential Executive Order declaring the emergency will also proclaim a bank holiday of several days. This will be for the purpose of preparing the banks for the redemption rush to follow. When the banks reopen, the actual redemption period to turn in your $100 bills will begin. The Emergency Proclamation will also close the nation's stock markets for a similar period. Two excuses will be given for this. One is that the Administration will want Wall Street to absorb the news in an orderly manner without any chance of panic. The other excuse will be that large amounts of crime-related $100 bills are being laundered through the stock exchange. The cutoff of those cash transactions will come as a shock to Wall Street. As a psychological ploy, it will be a master stroke. It will seem to say that America has finally gotten serious about its inflation. The dollar will temporarily become stronger abroad, and the price of gold will plummet. Speculators with inside information will sell gold short ahead of time. Then after the price drops they will buy up the gold again. The psychological shock of the $100 bill ploy will soon wear off and then gold prices will head upward again on the crest of new crises. For all its dramatic impact, the repudiation of the $100 bill will have no lasting effect on inflation. It will be defended by the monetarists as justified by their money supply theories, but it will actually attack nothing but the symptoms of inflation. If inflation is really to be cured, it must be by going to its causes, and that cannot be done without tackling the scandal of America's missing gold reserves. Even so, the elimination of the $100 bill will have a lasting effect in another way. It will begin to condition Americans to the idea that there is nothing sacred about the currency we are accustomed to using. Only a little further down the road the process will be completed by replacing our shriveling dollars with a new currency, but even that will be only a way station on the way to the final destination of a cashless society. The final dream of the Money Monopoly Masters is to reduce everything to credit entries processed by computers. If they can achieve that, then they will achieve total control over the money supply and they believe they will also achieve total control over you and me. At long last we will all be their slaves. The Declaration of Economic Emergency will also have another purpose. It will secretly activate the emergency powers of the President for wartime measures. America will start moving more quickly onto a war footing. The bureaucracy of wartime controls will start cranking up, all in the name of fighting inflation, and having been terrorized by the government into turning in our $100 bills as we did our gold in 1933, we Americans will start developing a wartime mentality. It will take place at a subconscious level. Most of us will be unable to define why we somehow feel uneasy. But without being told a word, Americans will feel the ghostly pre-war echoes of the 1930s. The $100 bill episode will also leave many of us feeling helpless to resist the seemingly almighty government. The message will be burned into our minds, Obey or else. We will be on the road to war, and we will also be on the road to dictatorship here in America. Topic No. 3. My friends, these are the things which are now being planned for us. It is real. It is happening. If you still don't believe it, just think again about those moments outside the Washington Hilton Hotel two days ago. Assassination politics and suicidal war preparations have got to stop. We have arrived at this point along an economic road. 
so to stop it we too must fight back with economic weapons. The one economic weapon which is big enough to do the job is the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. That is what I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 56 last summer when I first began giving you my answers to the question, What can I do? Lately a few of my listeners seem to be losing sight of this, so I think I should say it again. If we want to do something about our headlong rush into disaster, the Fort Knox Gold Scandal is the way to do it. If we just get bored and walk away from it, my friends, it's all over. We will have forfeited America's last chance. Perhaps there are some among you who are growing weary of our preventive war of truth. That is why I was so reluctant ever to begin the process of giving you my answers to the question, What can I do? When I began doing this in AUDIO LETTER No. 56 last summer, I emphasized as strongly as I could that we will have to stick with it if we want to win. But in our speeded-up world today, scandals are like water poured over sand. They make a big splash for a moment, but they hardly sink in before they are gone. Many people get bored. They are forgetful. They lose interest quickly. And because all this is so true, our enemies always know they can get away with anything. All they have to do is wait a little while, and we will oblige them by forgetting about it whatever it was. If there are some who feel this way, it would be best for them to turn back now and go no further. Better to flee the coming catastrophe now, before it happens, than to end up later as a pathetic refugee from a devastated America. To those who feel they must make that choice, I can only say, Go, and may God be with you. But large numbers of you are still saying in your letters, What is the next step? What is the next action we can take? To all of you I say, May we now redouble our preventive war of truth. It's time for us to draw our second wind, because the longer we persist without giving up, the more dismayed our enemies will become. In Topic No. 2, I discussed the creation of the President's new Council on Integrity and Efficiency. I also revealed its unadmitted source, the secret new Constitution for Dictatorship in America. But like other recent Presidents, the current occupant of the Oval Office is an actor doing as he is programmed to do. In the past, other Presidents have later expressed deep regrets for taking actions which they did not understand at the time. Woodrow Wilson publicly regretted signing the bill creating the Federal Reserve System. Harry Truman regretted his creation of the CIA as he said in public shortly after the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, and at the end of his presidency Dwight Eisenhower gave a warning against the military-industrial complex which had dominated his public life. So there could be a ray of hope in connection with the new Council on Integrity and Efficiency. Just after signing the Executive Order to create it, the entity President Reagan said, quote, We are going to follow every lead, root out every incompetent, and prosecute every crook we find who is cheating the people of this nation. Unquote. My friends, if the President really meant those words, then we should take him up on it. If he did not mean them, then we should call his bluff, because the only thing more dangerous than a declared enemy is a false friend. Either way, you have a right to petition the President for redress of grievances. So my friends, here's what I suggest. The President promised to, quote, prosecute every crook we find who is cheating the people of this nation." Unquote. And we, the people, have been cheated out of practically our entire monetary gold supply. A hundred years ago thousands of hard-working prospectors scraped together that gold, one or two hard ounces at a time, but a few manicured international bankers 
and their bureaucrats were able to mine all that gold out of Treasury depositories without even soiling their hands. The President also promised, quote, we are going to follow every lead, unquote. If he means those words, then he should be eager to do what neither Senator Proxmire nor the Federal Reserve Banks have been willing to do up to now. He should be anxious to follow the many leads which have already come to light over our stolen gold. My friends, we should bombard the White House with mailgrams, not letters, not postcards, but mailgrams. The more the better from you, your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. It will cost you some money to send mailgrams, but the stakes are enormous. This is one of those moments when half measures or penny pinching will cost us dearly, very dearly. We must have impact. To send your mailgram, simply call Western Union and say that you want to send a mailgram to President Reagan. Then dictate your message. Here is a sample to get you started. Dear President Reagan, When you created your new Council on Integrity and Efficiency recently, you made some comments which I heartily applaud. You promised to follow every lead in rooting out those who are cheating the people of this nation. I would like to believe that you truly meant those words, and so would all my friends and neighbors. Therefore, I want to call your urgent attention to some very glaring leads which need to be followed. They point toward disastrous cheating of the American public by certain individuals in government. I am referring to the mounting evidence that large amounts of America's alleged gold stockpiles have been illegally disposed of. In a cassette tape commentary last month, Dr. Beter made public two Treasury documents which contradict each other. Both documents pertain to the London Gold Pool shipments of the 1960s, but there is a discrepancy of 165 million ounces between them. At current prices that is over $80 billion, far more than the budget cuts you are now proposing. If any lead deserves to be followed, surely this one does. You can do that easily, Mr. President, since Dr. Beter's Washington office is located close to the White House. Dr. Beter has promised to keep his listeners informed of your response, and I will inform everyone else I know in turn. End of mailgram followed by your name and address. My friends, Time is growing shorter and shorter. We must know who is for us, the people of America, and who is against us. Senator Proxmire has shown that he is not for us. The Presidents and Directors of the Regional Federal Reserve Banks are gradually doing the same thing by not acting. So now it is the President's turn. Let us pray that his response will be different, but either way we will know. Now it's time to give you my last-minute summary. Two days ago an attempt was made to cut short the new administration under the name of Ronald Reagan, but the attempt failed, giving us a reprieve from an immediate return to total Bolshevik control of the government. Even so, America is being shut down for war. A declaration of economic emergency is being planned for late this year that will include repudiation of the $100 bill. At the same time, the machinery of dictatorship is slowly taking shape all around us. And now plans are once again being laid, not only here but also in Russia, for a first strike in all-out nuclear war. My friends, there is only one way to stop all this that is, to expose those responsible before America is put to the sword. The sword of our Lord Jesus Christ is the truth, and if we will only use this weapon of the truth, we will find that it is more powerful than all the other weapons conceived by man. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.